I'll let everyone puddle in first. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, thank you, Cindy, and welcome everybody to Columbus. And um, um, a couple of disclosures from my talk is number one, you will not see any waterfall plots or swimmers lanes. <laughs> we won't talk any science or any hardcore science. Um, second disclaimer is I'm obviously on the surgical side. So I do have some surgical pictures in here. Um, I had Sydney screen all my slides. So if anybody doesn't like my slides or thinks they're too gross right before lunch, you can blame Sydney for that. So um, those, those are my two disclosures. Uh, and not, not to be repetitive of what, are, what we've already talked about, but this is the pathway that drives, uh, drives and you're still going to hear me call it PVNS because that's sort of how I was trained with this. Um, and I always say TCGT instead of TGCT. So um, I'm going to stick with PVNS, which is what I know. So hopefully nobody from the World Health Organization is here to yell at me for that. But um, we're going to call it PVNS. And, and we know it's rare. We've talked about it, but it involves the joints, right? And the thing that 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 I get involved with is the bottom part of this, this slide here is that it's not so much the CSF1 pathway, it's all the recruitment of the inflammatory process that goes on because of the CSF1 pathway. So it's all the, the macrophages and all the inflammatory cells and the swelling and the pain that that causes is why we get aggressive with this from a surgical standpoint. Um, so again, there's two subtypes of this. There's the nodular type, which, um, which is um, just you know, one small glob of this stuff within a joint or the diffuse type. And, you know, the, the black box of what we don't know, and a couple of people sort of asked this question in, in a roundabout way, is that when we look at all of these different subtypes under the microscope, they all look the same. They all have the same expression as CSF1. So we don't know why some people get nodular and it's really easy to treat and it never comes back or why some people get diffuse and maybe it's diffuse disease that they have one knee scope and they get better with, or it's diffuse and they have multiple knee scopes, go on PEXI, go on clinical trial, and also ultimately end up with a really angry and unhappy joint. We don't know and we can't predict what patient falls in which category, which is the hardest part, and why there's no clear algorithm of treatment of you have diffuse of the knee, so you should go on pexidartinib first, and then we come off then and we do this. There's no clear algorithm for any patient. So also why it's important that there's a team of people taking care of you with this disease because not every patient is the same of, of how they respond to these different treatments. Um, but the primary one that I'm going to focus on today is the diffuse type. Uh, we already know it primarily affects the knee, and that's uh, most of the slides that I'll have here. It can occur anywhere, but most of the time we see it in the knee. But the biggest challenge with this is the bottom point right here, is with optimum treatment of the diffuse disease, we're looking at up to a 50% recurrence rate. So this can be a challenge to get, to get a hold of. And, and we know that when you have diffuse type DGCT, you can have a long, prolonged clinical course. Um, you're going to have multiple treatment options. You're going to have multiple failed treatment options. And the recurrent disease maintenance has to say multiple surgeries that can lead to a substantial morbidity of the joint, even if you eventually get ahead of the TCGT. So you can get rid of your disease, but because it took three synovectomies to get there, you may still have a painful stiff joint. And that's one of the biggest challenges we have with this disease is, is it's hard um, in some patients to, to really come up with a good clinical outcome. So with everything you've heard from Dr. Burgess and Dr. Shinoko, the reality is, and I was hoping Gabe wouldn't come back for this part of the talk, but uh, the reality is, is that surgical resection is still the standard of care for this. Everything else we're hearing, I mean, PEXI is absolutely FDA approved, but we heard about the side, effect, the side effect profile. A lot of these other clinical trials are in patients that aren't amenable to surgery, which means that if you are amenable to surgery, this is still the standard of care for this disease. And a lot of times we can cure you with surgery. So um, it's great that we have all these other drugs coming on the market. And I think the overall goal will eventually be that this will become a non-surgical disease once we find that sort of magic bullet of what kills this stuff. Uh, but right now, um, you know, this is still the standard of care for this disease. Um, radiation therapy, as Dr. Burgess said, is really sort of a historical point more than anything. We talk about it sometimes in patients who have refractory disease that aren't eligible for certain medications and things because it, it is very responsive to radiation therapy, but that comes with its own, own host of side effects as well. Um, so the goals of our surgical resection are, number one, to reduce the symptoms from this and to prevent the joint destruction because what this chronic inflammation in the joint causes is to wear down the cartilage. And when the cartilage wears down, your joint gets painful and you essentially have an arthritic painful joint. So our goal from a surgical standpoint is really to prevent that joint destruction and ultimately improve limb function and hopefully minimize the risk of local recurrence. When we talk about surgical options, and we'll go through these in great detail, but there's a whole bunch of things we can think about with arthroscopic or open, 
anterior synovectomy, posterior synovectomy, sort of how we go about that. So there's a whole bunch of different thought processes that we have to take into effect. And just like the medical treatment of this isn't a clear-cut algorithm, neither is a surgical treatment. So every surgical patient is a little bit different in terms of, of what they should consider. But what we do know is that surgery, even though it's the standard of care for this and, and really the backbone of treatment, it's associated with a recurrence risk. It's associated with some increased morbidity because anytime you have an operation, you're gonna have scar tissue, you're gonna have the, the, the sort of outcomes from the operation. And the surgery itself can impair your quality of life. So even though it's the standard of care for treatment, you know, sometimes we, we are challenged with outcomes even though uh, we, can, we can sort of cure you of the, of the PBNS. So the diffuse disease in particular has shown high recurrence rates, whether you talk about arthroscopic or open surgery. Um, the localized group is really not what we're talking about here because overall 10% or less chance of recurrence, although we do see it uh, when you have localized disease, really the diffuse disease is a challenge. And again, we talked about how surgery itself can lead to morbidity in the form of stiffness and pain. And oftentimes it takes more than one operation. And the more you go in, the more you operate, the stiffer the joint can get, uh, even, you, even if you're making headway in terms of the disease process. Um, this was a slide I stole from um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Healy um, um, in New York. Um, this was a study where uh, about 300 patients were looked at, a retrospective study. And we got some interesting, um, we got some really interesting um, data from this number. Um, number one is that 40% of the time in relapsed patients, the disease is going to come back again, which is, which is sort of a, a little bit of a humbling, um, uh, a humbling thing to think about. And the median time to recurrence was in about the first year or so. So if you undergo an operation, you get clear uh, margins, you can do a complete synovectomy, 40% uh, of the time it's going to come back and it's going to come back more than one time. And when it does, it's usually going to happen within about a year or so when that happens. So um, this gave us some good sort of baseline data. Um, the other thing to look about is um, this, the slide on the, the bottom uh, right hand side right here. And this was after a presentation to referral centers. And this is really, this is sort of an interesting sort of side note and why it's important, I think, to have a multidisciplinary team take care of this. So when, what this means is when you get referred to a referral center, if you got referred as a new diagnosis, you have a better chance of the disease not coming back than if you get referred after your first diagnosis. So in other words, probably what this tells us is your first chance at this is probably your best chance to get eradicated of disease. So if you go to a small community hospital and you have diffuse disease and you get sort of a, a knee scope done where they do a synovectomy, but it's not a complete synovectomy, but they establish diagnosis of PBNS and then refer you to a referral center, the chance of getting ahead of this disease or the, the chance of it coming back multiple times is higher than if you would have just started at a, at a, at a tertiary care center. So again, to your, to your point in the back, can, can some of this be done locally? I mean, we'd love to do that, but the reality is your outcome is likely going to be better if you're treated at a multidisciplinary sarcoma center for this disease. And I put this up here. This is, again, was one of Dr. Healy's slides, because I think this probably highlights the pathway for a lot of people in this room not so much the specifics of what's on each of these boxes, other than this disease is a journey, right? There are multiple steps along it. There are multiple hiccups along it. There's recurrences, there's trials with medications. There's good responses to medications. But the other thing I liked about this slide a lot is, at least in today's world, in the current state of where we are with PBNS, I think a lot of times people end up with surgery at the end of this, despite going on different medications. Because to Dr. Burgess's point, we don't, we don't necessarily know the endpoint of pexidartinib or some of these other uh, monoclonal antibodies. So you go on it, you get a good response, then what's the strategy to come off that drug? Or is this a lifelong process? Or, you know, we've, we've talked about it, we're kicking around the idea of having some clinical trials where it's sort of a sandwich effect where maybe you, you get a biopsy to establish diagnosis. And be interested to hear everybody's thoughts in the panel discussion. And then maybe you go on a systemic therapy for a period of time, maybe to each max response on imaging or symptoms wise or whatever that is. And then you go on to surgery to sort of consolidate the disease. And, and I think that's probably going to be eventually the, the, the pathway that a lot of folks will end on. But again, I think this just illustrates that this, this disease is a journey for sure. And ultimately, a lot of patients will end up at, at at least one surgery at some point in time. Um, and this was just the case example from this patient um, from that last slide, showing that when, when they presented in, the, in 2019, a large uh, uh, glob of PBNS sort of around the hip joint going into the pelvis, around the neurovascular structure, so clearly not a good surgical candidate right from the get-go. 
went on pexodartinib, had a great response to pexodartinib where a lot of the tumor bulk re, um, um, sort of disappeared. But unfortunately, due to the disease process itself, the joint itself was destroyed despite a good response to treatment from the infl inflammation and things that go on. Um, so he requ required a hip replacement. Um, it has good pain relief now from the hip replacement from the arthrit arthritis type pain. Is still on pexodartinib to keep the disease under control. So sort of a combination of, of treatments um, to, to sort of um, live symbiotically with the disease, not necessarily with a cure, with a cure for the disease. Advance doesn't want to go into my next slide. Slight delay, gotcha. All right, so now let's get into some a little bit of specifics about your different options from a surgical standpoint. Again, with the underlying tone is that there's no one pathway that's clear for everybody. So this, I start this off with talking about sort of the arthroscopic or the sports medicine angle on this disease, and then we'll go through open synovectomies and then sort of finish with joint replacements and sort of how that that can be uh, utilized in this disease. So, um, so this first case is is. Uh, and in a younger patient, a 46-year-old male who's an athlete, um, and he first noticed this disease because his race times were down, which is probably sort of a lucky way to find out you have this, um, and had intermittent knee swelling. And so this is an MRI of the knee looking at it from the side. Um, so this is the kneecap over here, and the knee joint is down here. But this sort of clump of stuff in the lower part of the joint uh, is some nodular PVNS, or at least, uh, at least what we think is nodular PVNS in the knee. So uh, he has some mechanical symptoms with running, but overall is keeping up a fairly high level of activity. So when we see patients like this, this is where we like to collaborate with our sports medicine partners if we don't do a lot of knee scopes um, ourselves um, and say, can this be arthroscopically removed? And, um, and Cindy made this point in our introductory talk is you gotta be careful how you take these ar ar arthroscopically as well. It's not sort of the standard sports approach where you go in and munch this thing out and you can sort of spread the debris throughout the knee. You wanna be able to take this out sort of in one big piece if you're gonna take it out. So again, collaboration with whoever's doing the surgery is really important. Um, this is what it looks like when we get into the joint. So here's some arthroscopic pictures showing the character of, of what uh, diffuse um, uh, TGCT can look like. And you can see sort of these brown, uh, brown fronds within the joint. It almost looks like seaweed within the joint. That's what this stuff looks like on arthroscopy. So if you have somebody who has localized disease to one portion of the joint, or if it's diffuse disease, it's just contained to the anterior portion of the joint, Oftentimes, we'll start with an arthroscopic sort of debridement or arthroscopic removal synovectomy uh, of that lesion. But when we talk about the whole treatment options from a surgical standpoint, there's a whole bunch. You know, we can either choose to observe these or we can go all the way on the other end and do a big mega joint replacement where we can, you know, cut out bone and get a real complete synovectomy done. We can talk about arthroscopy. We can talk about an open synovectomy. Uh, and again, for historical purposes, sometimes radiation therapy is still brought up. So just like this disease itself exists on this wide spectrum from, you know, very uh, mild localized disease all the way to diffuse, our treatment options also exist on this huge spectrum, and it's not always clear which, which way you should go with things. So there's controversy in the literature as, as far as what's better when we look at open versus arthroscopic. Uh, so on this side of the slide is what an open synovectomy looks like, where you actually have an incision down the front part of your joint. The joint is open and all the abnormal tissue, all the PVNS, I wanted, it didn't like that picture either, I guess. So um, all the PVNS is cleared out and a complete synovectomy is performed. Or is arthroscopic better, you know, where you go in with tiny little incisions, but you have to be able to see the whole joint and remove all the abnormal tissue sort of looking through a keyhole instead of opening the door, if you will. So, so which, which approach is better? And again, it, it's cloudy. There's a lot of selection bias in literature. There's no studies that have compared this sort of head to head. Um, and it's almost a retrospective thing. And, and by that, I mean is, so say you have PVS in your knee and you get an arthroscopic synovectomy and it doesn't come back, then you know that was the right choice, right? So, but we'd have no way of predicting that prospectively as far as who should uh, undergo which operation. So there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of sort of bias in who we select for these different procedures. Um, so here's another case uh, to sort of illustrate that. So here's a 39-year-old female. She had chronic knee pain and swelling. Her pain is limiting. Her activities of daily living is starting to affect work. She still has pretty good range of motion from 7 to 115 degrees, 
but she can only walk one block because of the swelling and the pain that she has. And um, you can see sort of up here, again, this is that same side view of the knee. Um, the white here is fluid. So this is the swelling that's in the joint and the sort of black frondy stuff is, is, the, uh, is the TGCT within the knee. So a little bit more extensive disease uh, than the last one I showed. Um, looking at it from a front view here, this is a front view of the knee. And it's sort of just like this black frond stuff that you see throughout the joint. Uh, is, is all the, the PVNS that's within the joint. So this patient we worked with, I had my sports medicine partner and said, wow, it's contained to the front part of the joint. She sells really good range of motion. Um, let's see if we can do this arthroscopically. So again, some arthroscopic pictures of what this looks like. You can see that brown sort of frondy stuff within the joint. And this is our electric shaver that we put in here. And we go through and, and, and you can almost sort of see here where we start to shave out that synovium and to get back to normal tissue. But, a, but an arthroscopic debridement of this can take several hours to complete because you're going around the joint and trying to shave out all this abnormal brown tissue. But if you think you can do it, it's certainly less morbid than opening the joint up and doing an open synovectomy. So she had an arthroscopic synovectomy. Fortunately, 10 months, 10 months later, it's back. So, you know, despite doing a complete arthroscopic synovectomy, the disease comes back. So we say, well, it's still confined to the front. Let's, you know, she recovered well from her last operation. Let's go in arthroscopically again. And unfortunately, it looks almost the same the second time you go in. So this is the challenge we have with this disease is it's really hard to get ahead of sometimes. So, so sometimes there may be a role for both. Sometimes there's a role for arthroscopic. Maybe arthroscopic is the first step and then you go on to open synovectomy if it comes back. Um, but there may be a role for both. And I think the take home is, and I apologize for the slide, I thought we'd have a lot more Columbus audience here that would appreciate this, <laughs> not this huge regional showing. Um, but, but there you go, I know. Uh, we got a big game coming up tonight. So I'm glad this was during the day and not this evening. I think Sydney planned it that way. Um, but the reality is, is that teamwork makes the dream work with this disease. So the more people you have involved with your care, not only between surgery and oncology, but even within surgery. You know, I'm sharing all these cases with my sports medicine colleagues, with my partners in orthopedic oncology, and we're all trying to make up uh, sort of a, a, a decision of what makes the most sense for that individual patient, because there's not, there's not sort of one pathway that always is the right answer. So let's talk a little bit now about open synovectomy. So that's arthroscopic, okay? So the sort of tear up or the step up, and really probably what would be considered the standard for this uh, is what are our indications for, for when we see, or when we consider right off the bat going to open synovectomy? So this is a 36 year old patient of mine. He had a history of a whole bunch of things, right? He had an arthroscopic synovectomy. In fact, I think he had a couple arthroscopic synovectomies. He had a previous open synovectomy. He's been on Pexodartinib. He was actually on the MX trial. And despite all those things, he still has all this, I'll use this pointer here, all this sort of bulky disease in the front and back of the joint. Um, so this is, again, an MRI scan looking at um, the back of the knee, and this is looking at it sort of in cross-section. You can see there's a big bony erosion here, and there's some PVNS within the bone itself as it erode, eroded in there. So this is not a patient that you're going to do any favors with another arthroscopic exam. When you see this much bulky disease, this much involvement, failed multiple, si multiple lines of systemic treatment, you know, an open synovectomy is really going to be the best option for this patient, Okay. We're unfortunately seeing this in younger and younger kids, right? Where sometimes these clinical trials and these drugs aren't indicated yet. And I was excited when Gabe said this, this new trial is open to 12 year olds. We've never had anybody under 18 before that we can enroll on a clinical trial. So it's exciting that we're starting to look at this, but this was an eight year old patient of mine who presented with this. And you can see how bulky her disease is. This is all PVNS all through the whole front part of her joint, right? And this is looking at her joint from the side. And you can see the whole inside of the joint is just coated with this stuff. Um, and here's gross surgical picture number one. This is what this stuff looks like when you take it out. But see how bulky that is? This is different than those slides I showed you, the, the, the disease you can go in and shave out with an arthroscopic shaver. If you try to take this out, you'd be in, in, with a scope, you'd be there for about 15 hours, probably trying to munch this thing out, right? So when you see patients that have this big bulky disease or a lot of joint extensive involvement, going to an open synovectomy is gonna be the best answer for them as the, as the, first, um, uh, as the first go around with, with, uh, with this disease. So let's talk a little bit and more about sort of surgical techniques and surgical decision making. Um, there's a lot of things we have to think about. And, and again, I, I mentioned there's no clear cut algorithm. So if we're going to go with, a, with this, we have to number one, decide if we're going to do open or arthroscopic. 
Number two, we have to decide the sequence. We're going to do an anterior synovectomy or a posterior synovectomy, or if we're going to do both of those, anterior and posterior synovectomy. Then we have to decide if we're going to do that in one surgery or two. Um, there are some uh, places that will say, okay, you need an anterior and posterior synovectomy. We're going to start by doing an anterior synovectomy. We're going to recover you for six weeks. You're going to come back six weeks later. We're going to then flip you on your belly, do the posterior synovectomy, and do it in a stage fashion. So um, that's a consideration. Uh, and there's no clear guidance in the literature. And this was an interesting sort of epidemiology study that looked at the surgical outcomes of patients. This was an international study, so it gave us a large number of patients, which is great, almost 1,200 patients. But when you look at what surgery they had done, it was all across the board. So there's no clear-cut answer as far as what's best. One stage open synovectomy was sort of the clear-cut favorite among people. About 50% of patients got a one stage synovectomy, but some got arthroscopic, some got a two stage open, some went to a tumor prosthesis, which is a massive joint replacement essentially. Um, some patients went to amputation and some patients took the wait and see approach where you know, we just observe if symptoms weren't too bad, which by the way, we're doing that more and more for patients sometimes when they're minimally symptomatic with this. So there's no one clear cut answer as far as what's best. So um, again, my, my practice of, of how we've managed this when we saw or when we see diffuse disease of the knee is to do a, both an open anterior and posterior synovectomy or one procedure. So one operation, it's about a three hour operation. We typically start with the anterior approach and we close the anterior knee up and while you're still asleep, we flip you prone and do the posterior synovectomy as well. The key to this is not necessarily the surgery, although the surgery is important. It's how we get you moving afterwards, right? Because the major side effect of this operation is knee stiffness. Outside of recurrence, we worry about knee stiffness. So we start aggressive range of motion on post-op day zero. We start getting you moving with a, what's called a CPM, which is a continuous passive motion machine to get your joint moving so it doesn't get too stiff. Um, and then likely discharge home with that, with that uh, machine as well. So again, what this looks like, so we start with the anterior approach. Um, it's a big anterior incision. It's bigger than a total knee incision because you have to be go in there and make sure you clear all the synovium out, out that's abnormal. So a big anterior uh, incision, the joint's opened, all the synovium is removed from the anterior portion of the joint. Uh, and then we move to the posterior approach. So this is looking at the posterior approach. This is a patient who's laying face down sort of on her belly. She's obviously got a huge amount of swelling in the, in the back part of her knee from where the PVNS is, is involved back here. Um, the posterior approach to the knee is a tricky approach. You know, I sort of say it's home base of the knee because your major blood vessel, your major nerves, your sciatic nerve all runs posterior to your knee. So this is a little bit of a tricky approach. Um, so we have to work um, sort of through inner nervous planes to get down to the back of the knee. So we sort of can divide where your sciatic nerve comes down, move the blood vessels out of the way. So it becomes a very sort of technically challenging operation. But there is a route that we can get down to the back of the joint um, and do a posterior synovectomy as well. So uh, this is just a slide highlighting the posterior incision. Again, it's not a small arthroscopic incision. This is a, a big incision on the back of the knee, mainly so we can find the blood vessels, nerves, things that we need to find to move them out of the way. Um, and then we, we're able to dissect down to the back of the joint uh, and remove the PVNS that's there. And you can probably appreciate there's a little bit of blob of PVNS right here in the back of the knee, but it's a deep hole to get down to where we need to get safely. So, and this is the humbling part about this. So now we've put you through a massive really operation with a, with a risk of stiffness in the joint, a risk of cartilage damage to the joint. Um, and despite that, and this was from that same study that looked at about 1200 patients, um, despite going through and doing an aggressive synovectomy, there's almost a 50% recurrence rate after the operation. So clearly we need better answers than just surgery for this disease process. So in summary, um, you know, as far as the open synovectomy, um, it's really indicated for people who have localized and resectable diffuse disease. You got to be aggressive if you're going to go the surgical route. One thing we know for sure is if you leave stuff behind, it will regrow. So that's the need for these big open procedures to make sure you can do a complete synovectomy for this. It's important that we have discussions before getting out of the operating room about this recurrence rate that we deal with and, and understanding that despite going through this, there could be up to a 50% recurrence rate. And clearly, and, and um, why, we, why we collaborate with our medical oncology colleagues and with, with the farm companies that are here um, is we need better solutions for this disease because can doing multiple big operations over and over, we're clearly not winning the battle in the majority of patients. So I'm excited to sort of see where that, that uh, takes us in the next phase of treatment for this.
And then I really wanted to end my portion of the talk talking about joint replacement for TGCT when we think about doing metal joint replacements. And there's a few caveats to know just going into this. If you're considering a joint replacement or, or if a joint replacement is brought up as potentially part of the treatment algorithm for this, is that this is going to get your function better. Because remember what drives bad function with this is that inflammatory process that wears down the cartilage that leads to an arthritic joint, right? So doing a hip replacement or a knee replacement to replace the arthritis that's in your joint is going to give you better function than where you started with, okay? So as a level setting sort of statement, it's going to improve your function, but how much better is it going to improve you? It's different than when grandma gets her hip or knee for arthritis or your neighbor who was, you know, a professional football player and has a bad arthritic knee gets a joint replacement. This is a different joint replacement. Typically, we're doing it in younger patients, number one. They're typically longer surgeries because we combine the synovectomy with the joint replacement. And because of that, it can lead to some stiffness and some poor outcomes than we see when we do this for arthritis reasons. So although it will get you better, it's important to know sort of expectations going into that. The other thing about that is, you know, people think, and I think the logical thought process is, if you're going all the way to a joint replacement for this, it's likely going to get rid of the PVNS. That's not true at all, okay? In fact, the recurrence rate stays the same. It still stays at that 50% recurrence rate than if you didn't have a joint replacement, but you're likely not going to have the pain with it. You may still get joint swelling and issues, but you're likely not going to have the pain because the pain generator is that worn-out cartilage, and that worn-out cartilage is now gone, but you can certainly still get recurrences with this. So we expect effusions or, or joint swelling afterwards, but again, it may not be um, as symptomatic after you've had the joint replacement. Um, so this is a patient who had a, a, a hip replacement for PVNS and unfortunately suffered a dislocation of their hip replacement. So there's no fail-safe operation. So it's different complications we think about in PVNS when we're doing joint replacements. If you're talking about a total knee replacement, you can have more stiffness. Uh, because of all the bleeding in the joint that happens as, as the synovectomy part of this operation, there's a higher infection rate with this um, and, and a higher rate of the components pulling loose. You know, we cement these onto the bone but if you get blood and things that interface, or if you get a recurrence of the PVNS that interfaces around the joint replacement, it can, it can cause that joint to fail. Um, when we talk about our hip replacement uh, patients as shown here, higher rate of instability, higher infection rate again, and higher revision rates overall. So although this is a good procedure in select cases, there definitely are some things to consider rather just, than just saying, I've had a painful joint for 10 years from this. It's time to get my joint replacement. Let's go ahead and knock it out and get it done. There's definitely some things you want to think about before jumping into that. So I'll show you a couple, uh, so a couple of cases of this. So this is a 47-year-old uh, female. She's had a 20-year history of dealing with PVNS, right? So living with her disease for that long. And this is what happens to joints when we have 20 years of PVNS. This is the joint space right here. And you can see, especially on this medial side of the joint, it's bone on bone, right? That cartilage is completely worn down. There's a huge bone cyst that is developed here on the tibial side. That's all part of the arthritic process that happens from living with PVNS for 20 plus years. Um, but she's had three arthroscopic synovectomies. Now she's got activity related pain that's really secondary to the arthritis that she has. And her range of motion is suffering because of it. She's only five to 30 degrees just because that bone on bone arthritis is causing the limitation of movement within the joint. Um, this is the MRI scan of her joint. So you can see here, she has, she has still diffuse disease throughout the knee. She's got this big bone erosion here. Uh, and you can see this bone erosion back here. But again, all of this diffuse PVNS that this patient's been living with for 20 years. And I'll tell you, from a surgery standpoint, I would never promise that we can do a complete synovectomy and get rid of your PVNS if you've had it for 20 years and you've had multiple surgeries at that point. Um, but I can get your range of motion better. I can get your pain better with considering a knee replacement sort of in that, in that context. So we have to talk to her about that. Now we have to make some surgical decisions, you know, and they're the same surgical decisions as an open synovectomy. Do we want to do a posterior synovectomy along with this or do you just stay anteriorly? Um, what do we need to do specific to our total knee replacement to make sure that we take care of all the damage that the, that the uh, TGCT has caused over the years within this joint? Um, but this is what she ended up with. Um, this, this, this was an anterior approach only. So again, our goal is we knew we weren't going to cure her of the PVNS, but our goal was to cure her of the pain and the range of motion symptoms that she was having from the destruction of the, of the TCGT. So um, she had an anterior approach only. Um, we, we did what's called a posterior stabilized knee, which replaces her PCL because her PCL was affected by the disease. Uh, we had to put this long, longer stem than we typically would on the tibial side. 
to bypass that big cyst that she had there that stabilizes that joint. And we use a lot of bone graft and cement and augments, but her pain got better and her range of motion is now about zero to 115 degrees. So she's still living with her PVNS, but she's got a better functional joint after the joint replacement. Uh, here's a case of a, of a hip replacement this time, and this is how these joints are different than when we do joints in, uh, in the elderly population for arthritis. This is a 31-year-old laborer, you know, and, um, and the analogy I use is we're turning your joint into a car part, essentially, right? It's a metal and, bear, metal and plastic bearing, and the more you beat on it, the more you use it, the quicker you're going to wear something out. So putting a hip replacement in an 85-year-old who wants to just get back and forth from Walmart is, just, is much different than putting it in a 31-year-old laborer, right? So we have to take that into consideration with, with patient counseling going into this. Uh, but he's had five-year pain. He's tried and failed conservative measures. He's no longer able to work because of this. He's got uh, swelling throughout his leg and a lot of tenderness and, and range of motion uh, because of it. And this is the PVNS. He's got this huge diffuse PVNS of his hip joint here. This is looking at him from the front. Um, and this is looking at him in cross-sectional view. So here's sort of the start of his hip joint here and this huge like dumbbell shaped PVNS that's sort of wrapping around the hip joint. So if we wanted to go in and just take this out with a synovectomy, there's no way to get into the hip joint to do that. The hip is a very constrained joint. So oftentimes to do a complete synovectomy and a hip replacement, we have to cut out the femoral head to get there and do the complete synovectomy. That's why the hip replacement itself is needed for that. Um, so we debride all the disease. This is what his PVNS looked like. This is chocolatey sort of mess of, of PVNS within the joint. Uh, but when you're doing a joint replacement, it does give us the best surgical exposure we can get because we're cutting part of the bone out of the way. So we can really get in there and see and do a much better and a much more aggressive synovectomy than if you're not combining it with a joint replacement. So this is probably our best chance at eradication of disease in a lot of cases is to go with a joint replacement to do that. Um, and this is what his post-operative x-ray looked like. So we scrape out all of the erosions that the, the TGCT caused. We bone graft those defects. Um, we have an intraoperative decision make of using bone cement or what we call a press fit technique for this. And um, most of the time we can get by with what's called a press fit technique. Um, but sometimes we have to be ready to augment bigger defects or have bone cement or bigger implants on standby if we need to. But this is sort of a standard hip replacement, uh, normal components that you would get if you had an arthritic hip. And, and this is an operation that allows him to get back and, and get back to work and be pain free and good range of motion in the joint. Um, so some potential modes of failure, we already talked about this a little bit. This is a case of PVNS that had a knee replacement and had a, what we call a mega prosthesis where the whole end of the femur is resected as part of that. But unfortunately the PVNS came back and you can see here that the bone is sort of eroded away around here. Um, so this stuff can come back despite uh, undergoing this massive operation and it can cause a problem when it does come back. So we worry about um, joint infections. We worry about what we call aseptic loosening, which is the, the components just pulling loose from the bone, usually second to, uh, uh, to disease recurrence. So again, it's not a fail safe and it's not sort of the, this is gonna be my last operation to finally get ahead of this thing approach. One of the things I wanted to talk about, and Sydney asked me specifically to talk on this a little bit, is one of the challenges we do have when we, when we go to joint replacements is we lose the ability to get accurate MRIs sometimes because we get so much artifact from the metal on the MRI. If you, if you know how an MRI works, it works by, by magnets essentially. So when you have a metal component in there and you get an MRI scan, you can still get an MRI scan, but it often kind of times can hide disease from all the artifact that we get. Um, so this was a patient who uh, had some PVNS in their hip. They underwent a joint replacement um, a long time ago in 1999. Uh, they did well. They had an 18-year follow-up um, and, and were doing well. But you can hopefully appreciate that the femoral head, the ball part of the hip joint, is sort of riding eccentric. It's riding higher in the joint than it should. That tells us that the plastic bearing in there is starting to wear out. So this patient eventually underwent a revision. And during the revision, it was found not only was there polywear, but there was also recurrent um, TGCT there. So, so oftentimes when we put these metal implants in the way, uh, they can sort of hide or mask sometimes the recurrence of disease, which is, which is an uh, interesting discussion and, um, um, and, and what we're gonna do about it. So this is what we've moved towards a little bit here. So these are two patients. Uh, this is a patient who had a, um, a knee replacement and on an MRI scan, see all this the black sort of haze in through here, that's the metal artifact that we get from having a knee replacement in there. So you can't really tell what's going on. 
but she had a massive recurrence of TCGT. And we're going to, and we're starting to get PET scans more routinely on these patients. And a PET scan is sort of, it's a metabolic scan, but it tells us how active tissues are. And TCGT is, it seems to be exquisitely active on a PET scan. So this is what a PET scan image looks like. And this tells us uh, or shows that she has a, a massive recurrence around her metal implant. So um, it's one of the newer upcoming tests that we're using more and more as a modality. We may even use it to judge response to treatment in some cases. Um, in other words, if you, uh, if you get a PET scan and you go on one of these uh, clinical trials, and I don't know if any of them have PET scans as, as clinical endpoints, but then get a PET scan to see how it's responding, it, it could potentially tell you how well things, things are responding to treatment. But, but PET scan is a good test for us from a surgical standpoint to look for recurrent disease in the setting of having metal implants. So uh, just in summary, again, you know, we have a whole bunch of uh, spectrum of treatment options for TCGT. This should really be a multidisciplinary discussion for each and every patient. Um, Gabe and I talk about all of our patients together to try to figure out sort of which algorithm they should fall upon. We talk with our sports medicine partners. But uh, you've heard this repetitive throughout the morning here is that this should be something that's taken care of in specialized centers. And from that first slide I showed you, we don't just say that because we think it's better care, but it leads clearly to better outcomes if you're treated at a tertiary center. So um, there's a spectrum of treatment options, and it's really a joint decision-making model to, to decide what's best for each individual patient. So um, with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you may have about that. You should see the stuff I pulled off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So obviously you have the TGC, you have the tumors, but, but like, what is it or what's the like method that like goes in and starts destroying the inside of the ball? Like really what, what's, what is, you don't think that that's not the tumor or is it? Um, no, it's, so, so the CSF1 pathway, you know, it, um, it not only activates other um, CSF1 active cells, but it recruits all these inflammatory mediators into your joint. So it not only sort of causes that bulky tumor to form, but it recruits all these macrophages and monocytes and all these other white blood cells that cause inflammation and swelling. And it's that inflammation and swelling that breaks down the cartilage over time. And when the cartilage breaks down, then you get erosions into the joint by that same pathway. So it's not the tumor cells themselves that actually cause the joint destruction. It's the inflammation that the tumor causes that causes the joint destruction. Does that make sense? So... Can I ask a question too? Sure. Yeah. So PET scans, right? You're talking about PET scans. Why wouldn't you use contrast uptake instead, right? It's not radioactive and- um, Cause we, for MRI scans, you mean? For, uh, for tumor, well, I guess maybe the oncologist, but for tumor response, instead of a PET scan, which has clear risks or just involved with radiation to use the uptake of contrast as your my, uh, metabolic marker, I guess. Yeah, I don't know if um, it, um, if if you guys have any thoughts on that, but there's different there's diffusion weighted MRIs that everybody looked at. There's contrast uptake. I think all those are good surrogate markers for response to tumor, uh, but PET scan is really the one test that's that's clearly a metabolic um, test for this. And specifically, when you have joint replacements and metal parts in there, it gives us the best picture for that. I think if you don't have a joint replacement, I think um, getting an MRI with contrast is probably gives you similar information. Yeah. Do you feel there's a limit on how many times you should have an MRI with contrast? Um, as long as you don't have an allergy of contrast, MRI is probably the safest, safest test you can get. There's no radiation with it. There's no long-term effects that we know of from an MRI. So as opposed to CTs, which uh, I forget, a CT is like 300 x-rays or something like that, radiation dose-wise. So if you get multiple CTs over time, there's a little theoretical risk of radiation exposure. MRI is not. MRI is completely safe to sort of get as many as you need, really. Jen, yeah. oh, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, as a surgeon, um, do you know if there's a consensus on <coughs> after surgery, when you should start uh, physical therapy, or what are the limits are? Because I see so many different ranges. Yeah. And I, I hear people talking, oh, well, my surgeon says, you know, wait two weeks, wait six weeks. But yeah, like for me, my last surgeon said, you know, six weeks is the cutoff. Like your, your range of motion is going to be very limited past six weeks. So, right. Right. I mean, some of that depends a little bit what the surgery had done was, right? Um, but, but to answer your question, I don't think there's a clear consensus other than the earlier, the better, right? As soon as you can get the joint moving, the better it's going to be, sort of regardless of what the procedure was. 
but if it was a procedure that required some sort of ligament reconstruction or tendon reconstruction or something, there's a chance your surgeon may want you to hold off a little bit on some motions, but for the most part, the earlier the better. That's why we get going on post-op day zero to start getting the joint bending. And there's a difference between passive motion and actively being, being a part of motion as well, right? Right, right. Because what And so passively means you put the leg in the machine and the machine moves it for you. Because what, what we don't want to have happen is anytime you do an extensive synovectomy, you're going to have blood left behind in the joint. And if you leave that blood in there, it'll congeal just like a normal clot does, and it'll turn into scar tissue. And if that turns into scar tissue, that joint won't like to move very much. So what you're trying to prevent by early motion is preventing that blood from congealing as much so you can get the joint moving. So really, the earlier, the better.